six or seven. John, all the old people. All right. I was there too. And we presented analyses of the bourbon and our lake to try to get at the question of whether or not climate change, specifically global warming, might be having some impact on our last cold water fish. And I'm going to take this rare opportunity to say, let's look back 13 years later and see if we were right or if we were full of crap. And I actually analyzed the data last week, so I didn't know when I submitted the abstract whether I was going to be up here confessing that, well, we were completely off base when we did that 13 years ago. So the bourbon is our cold water species in Oneida Lake. We used to have Cisco as well. They're the only freshwater representative of the cod family, circumpolar in distribution. Rarely occurs below latitude of 40 degrees. Oneida Lake is right at the southern edge of the range of the species. It's part of the Finger Lakes, the Oswego River drainage in, in New York. Large, shallow lake, known for its walleye press release just recently. We have a million walleye again, so if you don't care about bourbon, we've got plenty of walleye to entertain you there and help once more. They are native to the lake. They were observed by one of the earliest explorers of the area in 1810, Joe Clinton came through, gave us an outstanding description of the natural history and, and the occurrence of different species throughout central New York. And then because his travels were to survey a canal, built a canal that permanently altered those natural and original distribution of species through the state. But he saw the bourbon, and his response to it was not, not that unusual. He called it a curse. People didn't respect it. The bourbon has suffered that reputation in the Great Lakes area for some time. Even during World War II, the government was trying to get people to eat bourbon when food was short, and this was an unsuccessful campaign. They're not respected as a sport or food fish in the Great Lakes region. There are areas in Alaska and Canada where people fish for them and appreciate them. But in our area, they are generally disrespected. On Anata Lake, the first fishery survey by Adams and Hankinson observed that people were catching through the ice and they appreciated them so much they built windbreaks out of them. They would not eat them and they would not put them back in the lake because they have the same reputation as, as wolves. And in the wildlife world, every bourbon in the lake is one less walleye in the lake or some map like that. We don't have bourbon without the walleye and we'll all be happy. In fact, there's only one area in the Great Lakes area where Bourbon appears to be appreciated. That's Leech Lake in Minnesota, where they have the annual Eel Cop Festival. <laughs> All indications are that it's not entirely a result of the quality of the fish or the appreciation of it that is a different kind of event altogether. <laughs> and while I was looking for pictures, I found if you're not suitably depressed about the current state of affairs in America and the rhetoric that we're exchanging, you got another piece of evidence that things are in the wrong direction. The Hillfield Festival has now been canceled for this year because people could not pay themselves and they're littering and trashing out the area. And the community just says, screw it, we're not doing this anymore. So another thing to be sad about if, if you need one. So we're talking about climate change. If you believe climate change, the expectations are as water's warm, the fish fauna of the state of New York will start to resemble states that are further to our south now that will benefit warm water species, <coughs> penalize cold water species. The, the timing of when we turn from New York to, to Georgia, of course, varies with your, your modeling and the numbers you put in there. And all, all maps can be altered to, to absorb new data and new information. <laughs> but ultimately, our expectation is that if we continue to warm, we'll lose our cold water species, which is what I'm talking about today, and we'll see increases in warm water species. Four years ago, I presented analyses of, of stream fish comparisons from historical surveys in the 30s to Doug Carlson surveys in the 2000s, and the expansions of the ranges of warm water species in New York is, is, is very real. And, and now we're going to talk about a specific system and whether or not what's going on with our cold water species is, is worrisome. Oneida is consistent with other waters in the area. It has been warming through our period of record. We've been collecting daily or hourly temperature recording since 1975 and see a strong and significant warming trend. Bear in mind that Oneida, unlike the Finger Lakes, which are deep and have cold water refuges, Oneida was formed by glacial depression, not glacial gouging. So it's shallow, mixes quite easily for prevailing winds. We benefit from the, the Mohawk Valley wind tunnel, so we don't stratify very often. We do it usually as a pole. So there's not cold water refuges that, that are maintained for the summer for fish like bourbon who might think the shallows are getting a little bit, a little bit on the warm side. So our question is, 
is warming water impacts in the Burbank. This is a paper out of Wyoming that came out pretty recently where they're projecting what stream temperature will be in 80 years and Burbank turn out to be the one species they think will be eradicated from all their streams because of inhospitable temperatures. So we don't actually target burbot with our sampling. We sample walleye and yellow perch, but we do catch burbot in gears. And I'll look through a few and see what's going on. This is a, our fall trap net sample, significant decline over time. I will point out that the paper came, that we said burbot are in trouble came out about here. One of our highest catches ever in the fall trap net happened there, which was the origin of the phrase, I thought they were extinct, which I now hear every single time somebody sees burbot in the lake didn't say they were going to be extinct, but that's what we hear. But nonetheless, despite that one anomaly, continuing trend to decline, highly significant. And our spring trial samples take place around May 1st, also continuing to decline, highly significant. And our standard gill net surveys, which run from July to June through September, another decline, highly significant, lots and lots of zeros there. And then our summer trial surveys, now the summer trial surveys are also down. And for those of you who are squirming in your seats, we had a robust discussion with Mr. Bartheroni and his pesky inequality on another study, and I was outspoken in defense of him, and just so you'll know, if you adjust the p-value for multiple comparisons, all of these relationships are still highly significant. But I don't want to get called out on that on the way home. I did do that. <laughs> so as big of and enjoyable a party as the climate change bandwagon is turning out to be, Due diligence would require that we think of other things that might explain the decline in burbot. One would be overfishing. We don't think that's happening here. It's a robust ice fishery because of burbot snuff bags, of food fish, or sport fish. They're not targeted. We have ice fishing krill surveys. Burbot are caught, but not big numbers and no change in, in people's targeting of them that would make us think that fishing accounts for what we've seen. The lake was colonized by double crested cormorants, which were considered quite evil by our local angling group. They are capable of eating lots and lots of fish. By weight, burbot on some years will be in the top five or 10 species in cormorant diets, but they're never important numerically, which would be the important factor to consider in terms of population declines. And while we have the decline in burbot coinciding with the increase in cormorant numbers, we did not have a rebound in burbot when cormorants started to be managed, so that does not seem to be the most robust theory for what's going on with burbot. And zebra mussels came in at about the same time in the early 1990s. That's an awkward one. Zebra mussels are still there, burbot are still down. I don't know what the mechanism would be for how zebra mussels would negatively impact burbot, but I guess that was hanging out there for us to, to be confronted by. I'm going to stick with the climate argument, and then I'll try to walk you through why I believe that's true. We have old data back in the 70s to the early 90s when we caught enough, enough burbot to actually look at things like length and weight that show some of the dynamics that happen between spring and fall and over summer dynamics. We, we have pretty reliable weight loss in terms of what they do <coughs> in the summer, what happens when they come out. We look at their liver, which is an organ that stores a great deal of energy, lots of loss of liver waves, lots of loss of fluids in the liver, no liver oil left over at the end of the summer. Have enough fish to actually look at relative weight in the early period, late period, and we do see bigger declines in relative weight in the 90s than we did in the 80s, which implies that conditions were getting more inhospitable for where we even during that short time frame. This is worth noting. This is a where going into the summer with a huge liver, big energy storage for it, and then coming out of the back end of the summer where they've utilized all that energy. The reason they're utilizing energy in their liver during the summer is because temperatures get high and the percentage of empty stomachs are essentially not feeding in the summertime, which means they're reliant on that energy stored in the liver in order to get through the summer. Then in the fall, they come out the back side and start feeding again. And the fall is an important feeding period for the burbot because they spawn under the ice, so they need to get out of that high, thermally stressful summer zone and start eating in order to start making eggs and, and prepare to spawn. So the question is, we have a prime population, is the summer becoming harder on burbot than it used to be? All of those over summer interactions are perfectly natural. The cost of colonizing freshwater for the burbot is that they no longer can migrate with cold water. So the liver actually is a normal source of energy for burbot to get through periods of thermal stress when they're trapped in inland water. So that's not unique to Oneida that goes on with all inland burbot populations. But the question is, is it going on longer now? Is it starting to get to the point where it's difficult for them to, to recover in time to spawn? So we have a 
Kinetic probes, there's a, a model published in 2003 that I used, and essentially what we're trying to do is track how the temperature affects their feeding, the energetic cost of being alive out there, they, they stay pretty high when it's up, there's a period above which they start to lose weight because their feeding and activity goes down because it's too hot, and they start using the liver energy. The lethal temperature is somewhere in the 27, 28 degree range, but anything over 21, it appears, based on models, they're gonna start losing weight. So is that period longer now than it was in the old days? And can we argue that that's why we're losing our vermin or seeing reductions in the vermin population? Early on, it looks like we could fit us. The line here is at the point at which we think they would quit feeding or at least reduce feeding enough to lose weight. Early in the period, it looks like they could have kept feeding right on through July. But now, in these recent periods, they're, they're under extreme thermal stress in July, not feeding and probably losing weight at a pretty rapid pace. August was never a fun time for Burbank and Lake, even in the early days, but you can see that's getting much hotter and more stressed. September, they can start feeding again. Again, an important time to gain weight and make eggs. In recent years, it's starting to edge up there, so they're probably not feeding until much later in September now than they used to. So all of this kind of says, used to be these guys were, were hanging out for, for a little while, not eating, and now it looks like it's longer. More straightforward way to present that is just look flat out how many days above these critical temperatures we observe. And this graph here shows for the first 10 years from the day set, the period of thermal stress and no feeding in the vermin we're suffering through lasted 13.5 days, now it lasts 64.5 days. So you have this period where they're relying on stored energy. It was just a couple of weeks of, of heartache for them back in the early days of our data, and now it's over two months, which has to be fairly stressful. 25 starting to push their upper limit. Never used to happen, now it happens with some regularity. So based on all of that, Jesus, I'm going fast, this is good. We'll get out of here early before it starts snowing. <laughs> <laughs> so not only, it's always been at the southern edge of the Burbitt's range. It was likely never ideal habitat for Burbitt, but they were able to make a living there and do okay. It appears that strong warming trends are correlated with reduction in population abundance. And we think that mechanism is primary prolonged period where they're losing weight and not feeding and suffering thermal stress. And probably the way that, because it's not hot enough to kill a vermin, the way that probably leads to reductions in population size is that it impacts their ability to reproduce successfully. If they can't eat and gain weight, they can't invest as much energy in the eggs, so either it reduces fecundity or might reduce egg quality. They spawn under the ice, so they have a pretty narrow window between coming out of that summer period and spawning. And the biggest weakness of the paperback when we wrote it was that we saw no pattern in larval abundance. So we're saying there's fewer adults and that's because they're not reproducing as well. And then finished it by saying, but we have no evidence to say they're not reproducing as well. And I was very gratified to see when I analyzed the data last week that we now do have a significant decline in larval fish numbers. So now it looks like the population size potentially going down enough where it's affecting their ability to reproduce, all of that classic pattern that you would expect if, in fact, the hot weather was hurting our bird. So, after we wrote that paper and presented it, and the conclusion of the paper was, was classic academic waffling. I think it says something like, if the warming continues, Onada Lake will someday be unable to sustain a vermin population. That was translated by the former director of the field station to they're gonna be gone next week, which led to the quote, I thought they were extinct. So without having said, Burbank are gonna be gone by 2008. That is what people said I predicted. And I wanna clear the air now and say that's not what I predicted, but I forgot my own prediction now so that I can get credit for saying what it was I said. So this is kind of a back of the envelope way to say, well, how long will it take before we lose Burbank altogether? 28 degrees upper lethal temperature for adults. Start with our July mean temperature over the last 10 years and the current rate of increase in July temperatures in 78 years, the entire month of July will average upper lethal temperatures. So that's longer than they'd likely last because it's gonna have to, they'll die before there's 30 straight days of lethal temperatures. But just to make the point that what we're talking about is decades down the line, 50, 60, 70 years will lose vermin, not tomorrow. So if we catch any vermin in the spring trap net this year, I didn't predict that we would not. 
A recent interjection model shows that juveniles can survive up to 30 or 31 degrees. It takes 110 years to get that. I'm not a parent, so I'm not sure about all this stuff, but I'm pretty sure you have to have adults in order to make juveniles, so it's probably <laughs> irrelevant what it would take to do juveniles. If the adults are gone, then it doesn't really matter what, what juveniles could have, could have supported. So what, <laughs> what can we do? We have this species that absolutely nobody cares about values. It is in jeopardy because of current trends in climate change, so clearly we want to take some action to see if we can slow or reverse that trend. And there's lots of different ways to go at it. We can think small, just kind of subtly reduce our energy demand, <laughs> see if we can't slow the rate of climate change. Turns out there's a little bit of pushback from administrations and the kind of policymakers who would help instill this kind of cactus. So, so we have to rule that out. We can think bigger and actually go to alternate forms of energy altogether and reduce carbon inputs to the environment, slow global warming. Again, another area where there's a little bit of pushback from the current regime of policymakers, so that doesn't appear to be practical either. But one thing that is going on that Washington likes to do is spend money we don't have, so the, uh, the only option available to us to help the is to spend money on our deficits. So I did a little bit of research on, on chillers of a suitable size to, to chill the entire lake of Oneida. It's only 300 and some odd trillion gallons, it wouldn't take over a million different chillers to do it, only about $13.5 billion, and we can keep the lake in temperature that can control our permits, so that's pretty reasonable to take care of that. We have a, a huge angling organization that's willing to chip in to cover the cost, and, and that's what I propose we have to do to save our permits on the lake. And I don't have to run over, I'm actually six minutes early, so we can take questions or we can all hit the road and beat this. Are there 